You can feather it. Yeah, it takes longer to feather it. Right? I'm trying to show you just the fastest way I know to, to blow, and, blow and go out of this thing. So, yeah, there's there's many different ways you can you can approach this, especially when we're doing like these small mundane operations. If it were me, I actually honestly have a script that is kind of just, you press the button, and it automatically just skews the person and puts like the gradient underneath them. So I don't have to worry about this stuff half the time. Alrighty, so then next, on this particular image, what are we gonna do? I wanna make it look like she's walking, right? So how do I make it look like she's walking? I'm going to select her and I'm going to duplicate her again. So now I have another copy of woman. I'm going to call this woman motion. Okay. And on motion, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do a filter. No. And where the heck is motion? Other. Ah, there it is. It's under the blur. So when I do a blur, so I'm going to go filter, then blur, while I have the woman motion layer selected. And I'm going to do a motion blur. So I'll leave that up there for you while you search for it. All right, and I'm going to take that layer and go ahead and click OK. And then I'm zoomed in right now at like 100%, so I want to zoom out and then kind of zoom in to where she's at. I can look at her. Now, the directionality, right, of where she's going is probably like this a little bit. So I want to change my angle so that she's looking like this. And then, so I can check my angle, I'm going to like, like make the distance a lot, right? Right, and it takes a little bit. You'll never get it exactly. I think like just that's fine. And I'll click OK. So now I have woman on top of women motion. Right, so I'm always controlling what that looks like. If I didn't have woman at the top of the stack, she'd look like that, right? She'd be a ghost. So then you put that motion behind it, right? So it looks like she's a woman in motion. Nice right. icing on the cake, usually at the end of the rendering. It kind of looks like she's glowing a little bit, actually. Very true. So if she looks like she's glowing, obviously I would then decrease the opacity of that layer so she doesn't look as motion-filled because I don't think she'd be walking that fast in that tiny little space. Cool. And then I could do that again and again and again. So, like, you know, if I want to get, like, the trailing motion or whatever it may be, 50 days. Uh, okay. Cool. All right. So that's for placing people into an image. All right. So let's go ahead and file save as. Save it as a JPEG. For the, you know, last class we got really into like saving this in the correct folder structures and everything else. In this particular case, that'll be in that video. You can watch back and see where those things go. Remember we talked about it. Um, for trying to get through the tutorial today, I'm not going to do that. Let's see how much we can actually get done. Alright, so I'll put it under tutorial. I'm just going to place it in Photoshop. And I'm going to save it out as a JPEG. And then I'm going to call it Interior Residential 01 is fine. So that's the first iteration of this with the woman. I'm going to click OK and click Enter. Right, so that flattened the layer and it kept this open. Okay. I think I just did that. Didn't yeah. I? Whoops. Well, you know, you have this folder zipped up. Uh -huh. So that's the purpose of having zip files, is that way you don't, even when you accidentally overwrite something, you didn't really overwrite it. So yeah, just overwrite it, it's fine. All right, so now I want to talk about um, of how to edit this. So. Uh, managing a Photoshop file. So I have my woman, I have my shadow, I have her, I have her motion data. So those three layers I want to place into a group and I want to turn them off. Okay? So I'm going to hold down Command in a Mac or Control on the Windows 
computer. I'm going to select all three layers. Okay? And then similar to the way I created duplicates, the next button over is this folder. Create a new group. Okay? I'm going to select that, drag on to the folder, and it'll group all three of those together. And I'm going to call that woman. So now she is, and I can turn her on as a group and turn her off as a group. So it includes the shadow, the motion, and her, right? Nice? Good? Okay. So let's leave her off. So the next step of this is trying to use filters correctly. I don't know how many times, even online, I see people that use filters and they look like really, really cheesy and everything else. And even so, I mean, filters are always going to be slightly cheesy. But there is a correct way to use them um, appropriately in a design sense, right? To create style in a rendering. So, you know, again, we're doing photo real here. But sometimes you scare the crap out of a client when you give them a photo real rendering right away, right? So I find I have to dumb down things a lot of times, especially when I'm doing design work. Right, even though I have a polished rendering, because it's just faster for me to do these things than it is to mess around doing SketchUp and everything else, because I have so much of a library of pre-rendered, pre -re things ready to be rendered right out of the box, like the carpets I have already, all that stuff, right? So it's faster for me to do that. So I dumb these things down. So some ways we can dumb this down is to turn it into um, a sketch or to add on top of the sketch. We use filters and this idea of blending layers together to begin creating style within um, photo real renderings or regular renderings for that matter or sketches or whatever you may bring into Photoshop. Okay, so the first thing is you'll notice my background layer is locked and that's for a reason so you don't ever lose the original image that you start with. So let's just leave that locked. Let's drag this down and duplicate that layer off so now I have background copy. And I'm going to duplicate that off, or not duplicate it, but I'm going to double click inside its name. And I'm going to rename that as base image. And then I'm going to duplicate it again. And this one I'm going to call. Uh, glowing edge underscore invert so for your sake when you when I do decide for you and when I decide to give you this file in addition to the video you'll be able to remember what kind of process we did so the glowing edge is going to refer to the filter that I'm using and then the process I do after I have the filter okay so I'm going to now go instead of using the filter menu to do the normal parts and if you notice something right I go to the filter menu and because I don't have an image selected or a layer selected excuse me I can't do anything in the filter gallery so the filter is going to apply to specific layers only so I'm going to go ahead and use this specific layer of glowing edge there that I named then if I go to the filter menu there's a thing called the filter gallery dot 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 What's going to happen is, is then under the filter menu, because Photoshop likes to assume that you're going to be doing repetitive operations, so you'll see motion blur. If I wanted to apply the same motion blur to another particular layer, it's always going to store my last operation under that menu there. So um, you'll see when we go to do another filter that you'll see filter gallery twice. Filter gallery is always this filter gallery here. I'm going to click on that. Ah, so the last one we used was diffuse glow. Let's turn that off. So under, to do a glowing edge, so I'm going to turn this into a black and white sketch first. I'm going to go under stylize, and I'm going to select glowing edges here. Now it ends up with like this really, 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 really kind of black and white muddled mess. Um, now there's some things we can do with that, which are quite nice, right? So if you think about it the way I do, I see black and white. So I know if I get black and white, I can I can do pretty much whatever I want once I have that. And I'm trying to get back to a line sketch version. Um, some things under um, glowing edges are edge width, right? How thick of a line do I want? 
typically subtleness is your best friend don't go super thick with anything ever like your text super big text no bueno um, edge brightness right how how black do I want that again keeping it somewhere in the middle is good because you don't again you don't want to ever go too far to the one spectrum or the other spectrum when you're dealing with raster graphics and then since I'm trying to do a sketch right sketches are sometimes fluid but Photoshop's gonna make them so fluid that they look fake. Right? So. so I always take my smoothness all the way out completely since it is architectural as well and I click on OK so then I end up with that right and that that's like not a sketch at all but you'll probably see a ton of examples out there of Photoshop work that looks like that which to me that's like that's like stage one of, of Photoshop I found the filters cool so what I can do with this is right it says glowing edge and then what's the second part of this invert but before we do that I still see color and I want a black and white sketch so like we did with the shadow of the woman I'm gonna go to image adjustments and I'm going to desaturate right so now I have black and white and then the last part right what do we name that invert so then I go to image adjustments again and I go to invert voila sketch okay still kind of cheesy really thick lines right so I would go back and I would say okay well that didn't quite work out like this is really thick right so trying to get a subtlety to it like the carpet right it's really 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 pronounced things like that now typically I don't ever hand a client this right if I'm gonna hand them a sketch I sketch the thing out. Um, but there are ways I can use this to mitigate what that photo real rendering actually does look like. Um, so by using my blend tool, which is layer blending here, I have my base image and then my glowing edge. I'm going to select my glowing edge, which I've now created as a sketchy object. And where it says normal, right, this is here, going to go ahead and I'm going to start playing with the way it will blend itself. So white values, depending on what I use, white values will turn transparent, right? Photoshop will say, okay, if I'm white, I'm going to turn transparent. I'm going to apply the black on top of that photoreal rendering. Uh, so I go normal. Easiest way to do that is using an overlay. Overlay is your best friend. I use overlay all the time. The only problem with overlay is it increases the brightness of your image quite often, so you have to be careful how many times you use it and how you use it. Um, you can go through, right, when you get home, you know, go through and see what every one of these things does, right? So if I do, like, darken, right, it'll darken up my image and then apply that nice little sketch over it, right? So I don't even have to worry about using the overlay and adjusting the brightness. That's one way. Problem being, right, I still have some issues with not actually applying the line like I wanted to and so on and so forth now if I went and inverted that back right so I can go back and play with what happens if I invert the other way right so darken just pretty much darkens that rendering you'll see I get some like shadow play and everything else so we definitely want to stay the way we were All right so you kind of want to just play with it and see what these do each one there's no good explanation linear light right it's gonna basically just take you know, some color values and then begin bleeding them into the sketch. So now it's beginning to look like the watercolor image that I wanted. Some other things I can tell you that are working really well, like the hard mix. Hard mix is like really, really bad to use. I generally never use hard mix because you end up with like Crayola markers, right? Overlay is another good one. Right, overlays kind of like gives me that nice tonality, right, that the darken wouldn't give me. It doesn't bleed out the, the pronunciation and the shadow play as much. It actually gives me my edges on my, my object. Right, and it takes that photo real rendering and kind of starts to blend out the details. But what's nice about it versus like using SketchUp or something like that is that I still get my reflection. Cool. 
Another thing you can do within this, so I'm going to duplicate off that base image, right, is maybe I want to keep, um, you know, a layer of kind of sketchiness, and then I want to kind of make it really bleed out. So you can begin placing another filter in there, right, and this one I'm going to call it sponge. So a lot of times when I really want to get it to a conceptual level, like I'll use a sponge filter to kind of just get daubs of color instead of doing the actual realism. Right, so I'll go ahead and under sponge, go filter gallery. So again, that was what I was talking about prior. You know, when I have filter gallery itself, what happens is, is that it's going to repeat the last thing I did and I don't want to do that. I want to go to the actual gallery. So I'll go to the filter gallery dot dot dot. Like, hey, there's something after this. And then within there, I'll zoom out. And then under artistic, right, I can select colored pencil. So you're really, you're really able to pick really whatever you want. I traditionally either do the sponge or the paint daubs um, when I'm trying to really dumb down a rendering that I've polished up too much. The sponge works really nice because it takes all of that color. It still maintains a level of um, detail but it begins to blur out the lines of actual realism within the photo or rendering for this matter. Um, and again, because I do this a lot, a lot of my, a lot of times like the thing is preset for me um, because I've used this so many times, I pretty much just set it and forget it. Um, brush shides is gonna increase how big those splotches of color are. Right, and, you, and you really wanna go through and check on each one of these, what it does. You know, there's a purpose for each one of them. Again, I'm going to leave mine at a brush size of 1. Yeah, we'll go up to 3. Let's make it a little bigger. 3. I'm going to type in 3. Definition of 10. And then a smoothness a smoothness of 8. Right? I'll do that. 3, 10, 8. If you want to follow along. And that will bleed out some of the rough edges on it. So it looks like starts to look like something I doesn't quite look as like a rendering anymore. Now I'll click OK. And that's going to take it a minute to process it. So we've got to go pixel by pixel by pixel and start to bleed and it starts to blend thresholds of color between what it is. It takes a summation of all the surrounding pixels and says, OK, I'm going to make all these pixels this. Right, and because that's overlaid, I can turn that off. Right, this base image does no longer matter. Right, and that gives me my, my two images. Right. So I still get the definition and the color of the lines, but then I get this bleeding color that doesn't have the actual photorealism anymore. Last part would be, you know, you turn on your woman. Still got my woman in the rendering, the real person. Right, you could even use her in, in this working process. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, then it looks like you actually do this. Right? Still got the reflection. Make sense? Any questions on that? So that's kind of like what Photoshop's really meant for. It's not really quite as much meant for drawing. I mean, you can. I've had a lot of times where I just go, go and do it. It's not necessarily, it's just tough, you know? And this is just really tough to do. Right? It's not meant to do any drawing or anything like that. It's meant for things like this, color manipulation in a raster graphic setting. Cool. So let's go ahead and file, save as. Save that as a JPEG. And you can call that 02. And then you'll want to save out this Photoshop file as well. Now, when you, I traditionally do not save my Photoshop file as a PSD. I save it as a TIFF file. And that's more so for, you know, in those dire, desperate times where the client calls me and they're like, hey, you know, can you give me this rendering um, a day ahead of time? And I'm still in the Photoshop post-processing thing and I'm like teaching a class or I'm like out playing at the beach with my dog or something like that, you know, like, and I, and I need to look at what I have already created or remind myself, I can still open a TIFF 
in pretty much any anything like even my phone I can look at a tip file right but if I were to send my client who's on the road and wants to see these things and he's a big rich guy and he's probably not at home in front of the computer wants to view it on his iPhone or whatever it may be he's not going to be able to view that Photoshop file right? he can view the tip file and make it super big but he'll eventually be able to or she for that matter will be eventually able to do it so since tips always 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 save the layer data unless you tell it not to I save out my Photoshop files as tips and uh, not the Photoshop and that's just so that I can open them up again right on my way home tonight on the train I can still look at what I did today because it's a tip file on my phone so instead of PSD which you see here go ahead and select tiff all the way at the bottom make sure layers is checked and the last part is get in the habit of always storing your color profile with your file so that way when I go to print this at Kinko's or I print it here I generally get into that three, three to five percent range quickly of color And then I can go ahead and close those off. 